Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, what the independents want, the seven key demands on their wish list. A backbench only question time, what else is Tony Abbott offering to woo the crossbenchers? And should we send more troops to Afghanistan or start pulling them out? Our panel tonight, ABC Online Chief Political Writer Annabel Crabb, Miriam Lyons from the Centre for Policy Development and former Federal and State New South Wales Liberal MP, Bruce Baird. Well, let's find out the latest news from Anthony Green on where those doubtful seats are at. Anthony, you've uh, said previously the coalition needs to win Hasluck to be any hope of forming government. How's that, look, uh, how's that seat looking for the coalition today? Well, I think Hasluck is firming up for the coalition. Um, they're up to 765 votes ahead, so it's, been, it's double what it was two days ago. Um, it's still mainly postal votes counted. Um, that's what they've been continuing to count today, and they're favourable towards the coalition. The question is what will happen when more absent votes are counted. Um, I think... I think they're at the point where they're not likely to um, have that result turned around. So at this stage, Hasluck's just about ready to be given away to the coalition, I think. What about Brisbane? Brisbane has narrowed today. Um, well, compared to the other day, it's 502 votes for the, for the coalition ahead, for the LNP candidate. I think that one's still in doubt. There's a, a lot more counting to come. The vote in Queensland, particularly in Brisbane, is not as far advanced as some other states. So I'd say it's uh, um, not yet ready to give it away, but it's still, we haven't seen anything which is indicating it's about to move towards Labor significantly. OK, there's another um, close seat in Victoria, Karangamite. How's that looking for Sarah Henderson, the, uh, the Liberal candidate there? Well, if the Liberals were going to win Karangamite, they needed to really close down the margin on the postal votes. The margin's 573 votes at the end of today. That's with, I think, nearly all the postal votes counted. There's pre-poll votes and absent votes to come, and the absent votes on past trends will favour the Labor Party. So Labor's maintained its position on the postal votes. You'd expect it to be able to hang on now with the absent votes still to come. So at this stage, it still looks like exactly what it was yesterday, which is 72 Labor, 73 Coalition, if you include the National from Western Australia, one Green and four Independents. And, Anthony, just briefly on Denison, uh, Andrew Wilkie seemed to be believing you a little bit more today. He seemed a bit more confident that he would win that seat. Well, I was confident last night. We had to wait for some postal votes to come in. The Labor Party needed 57% of the votes still to be counted. Of the first batch of 2,000 postal votes, Labor only got 52%. So, at this stage, Andrew Wilkie is still well on track to win. Andrew Wilkie will be the next member for Denison. And, Andy, on Monday night we talked about Tony Crook and whether you're counting him as an independent or a, a member of the coalition. And you said until they wrote to you and said otherwise that you'd be counting him as a, coali as a coalition member. Any developments there? Well, they did write to me. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Look, the National Party contacted me, WA National Party contacted me about having him removed from the list of coalition MPs and put in as an independent. Uh, and the way I can do that is to make the WA Nationals a separate party and remove them from the federal total. Um, when I explained that, they weren't keen on being that separate from the coalition. They just wanted their number, that one seat put aside. So at this stage, we've left the status quo. The National Party have made it clear what they think Tony Crook's position is. He's made it clear what he thinks he is. Um, and that's the way the totals are being counted at this stage. But um, no one was very keen on me actually removing 40,000 National Party of Western Australia votes from the national totals. Anthony, thanks again for the update. Thank you. Anthony Green, the ABC's election analyst. Bruce Baird, do you think the, uh, the coalition would be, would be feeling more confident now? Well, I think so. I mean, they're only uh, three away uh, for forming government. We've got three... Uh, they, they, they don't think that's going to happen, though, do they? They don't think they're going to get to 76. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the three people who are involved have got seats that are basically conservative with strong coalition votes. Oh, sorry, I thought you meant getting to 76 on their own. You're talking about the no, three... No, 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 with the three, three independents. independents. Uh, and that's quite feasible. Now, yep. all of them have got something in common, and they all hate the National Party. That's a small problem, seeing they're in coalition mm. uh, with the Liberals. Still, they'd have some company in the joint party room yes. there, wouldn't they? <laughs> no, no, we all love the Nationals. <laughs> uh, and uh, Stop Barnaby... Stop making jo them sound so much like a house pet, Bruce. <laughs> that's right. Well, Barnaby Joyce, I'm sure, would be leading the negotiations, not. Uh, mm. But, uh, you know, look, uh, Tony Windsor, who I had to deal with in the, in the State Parliament, uh, when we lost our majority and became minority government um, all those long years ago uh, in 1991. 
Uh, and he was very supportive of the coalition at that time, voted with us most times. He did extract a big price from us, however, um, in terms of, uh, you know, myself as Transport Minister, buses being manufactured uh, in Tamworth, not closing down Werris Creek. Um, I think he had a new um, uh, court that was built as well. He did pretty well out of it. He knew how to extract it, but he did vote the right way. And whenever any issues of no confidence, he always voted with uh, the coalition. So that was his track record. Mm. Uh, I think uh, Bob Ackshot is, is um, somewhat of a, a more uh, progressive, small L liberal, is yeah. the way I see him. And uh, then, uh, of course, Mr Catter is a, another issue. Mm. Look after his bananas. And did I you have any, have any dealings with Bob Catter in your time? I did. Right? He was actually rather interesting, as you probably know from our last encounter. I used to chair the Parliamentary Christian Fellowship, mm. and we used to have many every Monday night, and there were some interesting people to come along. Kay Rudd, for example, was there, and um, uh, Bob Catter. So that's uh, what maybe where they got to know each other. That's what, undoubtedly why the call was. Hi, Bob, how are you going? Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it was kind of interesting discussion. People like Bronwyn Bishop was there, so it was a strange amalgam of um, uh, in the spectrum. Uh, but certainly, look, he's a, he's a nice enough guy with some rather eccentric views. Uh, but uh, do, where do I think they'll fall? Uh, I, they keep on talking about stability. Mm. So if you talk about stability, uh, you may think, well, 77 makes it stable. If mm. you talk about uh, just forming a coalition to get there, 76 and they'll go, go with them. Uh, but, yeah. um, it's it's going to be about which party is more likely to go to term as well, though, yeah? So you would imagine that a Labor minority government would be more likely to see its three years out and also potentially, I guess, to get its agenda through a Greens um, with a balance of power in the Senate. So would depends that have some... On, depends on which agenda. I know that there was quite a lot in our agenda in the coalition that we have were taking up to the election and in our bottom drawers. And they stayed in the bottom drawers. There was lots of exciting proposals there. I thought, you can't touch this now. because mm -hmm. So it was safe governing. We also... I did as ma the maximum I could by regulation. Uh, so there was very little legislation that came through because... Uh, you knew very often that you wouldn't get through. So, and Tony Windsor was That's always shown it beforehand. Mm. Are you in favour of this? Uh, if he said no, it would never see the light of day. Well, I noticed that one of the um, one of the requests that the independents have made today in their recently released um, uh, list of seven demands is that um, they want written undertakings from each of the major parties or indications as to how they would formalise an undertaking to go full term. Yeah. The last thing these independents wanted, and particularly Tony Windsor seems to be uh, talking about this quite a lot. He said, look, I, I don't want to hammer together some arrangement that's going to last for, for three weeks and then fall apart. If, there's, if, if we can't come to an arrangement that gives um, a, a, a good prospect of three year of a three year term of stable government then I'd prefer to go back to the polls and he said that enough times today mm. to that it's not accidental I mean no, you know he is definitely I mean obviously of the need... three of the three of them that are um, they the, we learn more about these three guys every day I reckon and mm. today at the press club was really interesting it was almost like there was a sort of three different approaches emerging and Tony Windsor's is certainly sort of in case of emergency hit the election button I think yeah, well, those three country independents have written to both Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott today and met with them, outlining seven key areas they want to address before they'll consider forming a minority government with either side. The first key demand is all about the budget bottom line of election promises. We do think this is about the economy and we do think the next three years need uh, some uh, consideration of uh, things such as election promises uh, and election commitments and... Uh, both the costings and the impact on the budget and the, and the economic cycle for the next three years. So they want both parties to submit their costings to Treasury and they want to meet with the Secretaries of Treasury and Finance. Should either side be worried about this, Miriam? What do you think? Well, I mean, obviously it's much more difficult for an opposition to come up with fully costed election promises than it is for the government which has full access to Treasury. Mm. So, I mean, I think one of the things that's come out of this campaign has been that the Charter of Budget Honesty was a bit of a silly idea in the first place and probably needs to be replaced with something else. So I imagine that the coalition would be feeling a little bit more nervous about that demand than the government might. What do you think about that, Bruce? Um, look, I, I, th I think so. Uh, it is... Uh, I mean, the, the question 
about this uh, uh, budget honesty proposal is that it, it rests with Treasury. And, and there is a suspicion that uh, Mr Henry's got a little close to the government. Uh, I personally think he's a, he's a terrific um, bureaucrat. But, uh, you know, they have uh, the opportunity in three years to get close to the government. So it's you not, need just, it's not about it. Henry's own position, though. I mean, I guess it's no. about the question of the benefits of incumbency when you're yes. trying to prove your economic credentials. Yeah, so I think that's much the more the issue. You've got Indeed. all the resources when you're in, in government. To... And, and for a major opposition party as well. I mean, I think that this is a really interesting that's, thing that's come out is the lack of parliamentary resources that these independent members have access to. How yeah. are they supposed to be asking for more yeah. than, you know, yeah, extra yeah. funding for the local school or, you know, not closing right. the creek or whatever, when they haven't actually got access to that well, much got resources in the to, way of policy they advice. Would have, for the major accounting firms, there's often quite a lot of support from for the coalition, and there'd mm. be there'd be economists and, and accountants and taxation people working it out. But it's still not like having the resources of Treasury, the thousands of people that sit there modelling and you know the program, and they've got easy access to it. It's it's not a, a fair balance between the two. Well, we'll run through the seven uh, requests for information that uh, the three country independents have put to both Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott today. Uh, we mentioned the first one, which is getting access to uh, the Secretary of Treasury and Finance. The second is they want briefings from uh, eight of the main departments, the main secretaries of the departments. The third one is they seek briefings from all the caretaker ministers and also shadow ministers. The fourth one is pretty interesting. Um, they want to seek advice on plans to work with the clerks of parliament to improve the status and authority of all local MPs within parliamentary procedures. Annabelle, this seems like a nod to what Rob Oakeshott was talking about yeah. earlier in the week where he said you can't get a private member's yep. bill up if you're just a local MP and you want to raise a, an issue of local importance. Yeah, this is the sort of stuff that opposition MPs and independents um, are exercised about the whole time. They feel that they can't get their own local issues debated and discussed in Parliament, that the, uh, the, the, the whip discipline and the... Um, uh, and the tight management of government business tends to block out those local issues. So this is, they think, their big chance to get that fixed. This is also the sort of thing that is generally um, very vexatious to oppositions while they're in opposition. And magically those concerns often seem to disappear once that opposition uh, becomes a government. This is the... Bruce, yeah, how will this change parliament if, if we have uh, local members...